Thanks, Bill. Well, guys, welcome and uh, congratulations on rolling up today. As, as Bill said, uh, it's uh, yeah, I don't have to get on a plane. I think in the last couple of weeks I've uh, spoken in Hilton Head and uh, in Puerto Vallarta and uh, in Virginia without getting on a plane. So that obviously really, really sucks because normally I'd get on a plane and go to nice places instead of just sitting in my office doing, uh, doing nothing. Um, you know, you're getting towards the end of your day. I'm sure it's almost beer o'clock where you can... Uh, get out and, and relax. The downside is that it's uh, 6.30 in the morning my time. I suppose uh, at least the only saving grace is it's tomorrow for me, uh, being, uh, being Tuesday. Um, so if you all want to know what the uh, lotto numbers are going to be tomorrow, I can, uh, I can fill you in on those and how your shares and uh, stocks and shares are going to be doing. Uh, that'd be useful, wouldn't it? Um, so, as Bill said, my name's Steve Leach. I, uh, I started with Action in 1997. To give you a little bit of, of background, and I think it's useful in the context of coaching. Um, back in those days, there, there wasn't coaching. Coaching didn't exist. Um, I suppose to go back even further, people that were brought up in the industrial age or people that had uh, businesses in the industrial age, 5% of the people industrialists had 95% of the money, they had businesses and they were apprenticed by their parents who had the businesses. If you think back to uh, the times when you guys were uh, kids, most of you, um, you know, there wasn't these huge business, everyone wasn't in business, you, you had a family business and you were taught the ropes by your, uh, by your parents. Um, but what was interesting then is that sort of, I suppose in the, in the 90s, in the, in the late 80s, 90s, we had uh, you know, real global media. So people started hearing and seeing on the news about what was happening all over the world. And I think we got a skewed perspective about how many people were in business and how many people were successful in business and how many people were, um, uh, you know, the, the Gateses and the Jobses and, and those guys that were like overnight successes and millionaires. And I think the world went, woohoo, you know what? I'm just going to start a business. But they didn't have the education um, to run a business. Um, now, in, the, in the, the waning years of last century, when I, uh, I started with Brad, Brad Sugars, along with the Jim Rohns and the James Redfields and Deepak Chopras and Tony Robbinses of the world, we're doing huge workshops on personal development and business and skills and that sort of stuff, which was absolutely awesome. And Brad was talking about, uh, um, you know, growing and building business. But as Brad said, it just motivated idiots to go out and do more stupid stuff um, because they didn't have the how. Uh, and we got a bit of a backlash about that because people had come back and, and say, oh, you know, Sugar's is telling us we can grow a business and be millionaires and all that sort of stuff. And it's, it's bullshit. We can't. It didn't work. But it didn't work because you didn't have the how. So basically... Um, I started as a coach. Brad brought me on as a, uh, as a business coach. As far as I can tell, and nobody's yet uh, stood up to challenge the fact that I was the first business coach in the world because we were the first coaching organization in the world. I was the first coach. So we really did at Action Coach pioneer in industry. So as you know, working with Bill, we work with you guys to help educate you and teach you and guide you on this journey to entrepreneurialism where you finish the business where it, uh, it pays money. And so when you one day go, you know what? I've had enough of this. I've had a gutful. Then you can sell it for what it's truly worth. You can get an income from it. Um, so I, uh, my journey went, it was from lower middle class. Dad was a teacher. Mum was a nurse. So I didn't have any entrepreneurs in my, uh, uh, my family, so to speak, to give you some insight. And I just tell you that because I think it's important to understand the the, uh, the journey of the mind to achieve what you want to achieve as, a, uh, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, as a wealthy, happy, happy healthy, wealthy um, person. So undoubtedly, you've seen that the flip chart for today, today's flip chart, is the iceberg. No doubt you have been through it with, uh, with Bill um, already or in your, in your coaching process, and you can tell it's an iceberg because we get some water with it. Um, <clears throat> so who'd like to, uh, 
Who can tell me the what's at the tip of the iceberg? Who's going to unmute? Anybody? Success. What was that? Sorry. Success. Success. Yeah, of the iceberg, it's actually it's itself. What? Starts with B. I can't understand. You're unmuted. You're unmuted. Behavior. Steve, some, a, some, a lot of these people have seen it. A few of them are relatively new and have not seen it. So okay. just, just give you the background. Oh. Sorry for the Americans. I'll put a U in there. I'll have to delete that. Behavior. You can just automatically delete if I stick a U in it. We want the Australian version. So I'm behaving. <laughs> Thanks for that, Craig. That's awesome. There's been some other, other little bits and pieces stuck in. The tip of the iceberg is behavior because it's what everybody gets to see. This is the result. Yes, it's the result. Yes, it's the success if you get it right. But at the end of the day, the tip of the iceberg is what everybody sees. That is the product of what is below the waterline. So under the waterline, we then have skills. Your skills determine your behavior. Pretty simple. You need to learn something different in order to do something different. Now, different is important from just better. Right? Because becoming a better and better and better technician does not lead you down the path to successful business ownership. Ownership of a business is different, not just better. So under the skills we then have... And I'm just putting this down. I'll, I'll explain and expand on this in a, little, in a second. Oops. It's early. Oh, what is it? Beliefs. Under beliefs, we have values. And under that, we have identity and it all floats around in our environment. So for the novices that's the way it works. Our identity defines values, defines beliefs, defines skills. This comes from the from the bottom up and it floats in environment. So let me start the expansion. In in our efforts as coaches to coach clients we typically start at the tip of the iceberg down. There's no point starting in a whole heap of mindset and assuming that you're broken in your brain. The idea is that we adjust your business to suit the way that you are already thinking and the way you're already uh, operating. That makes it a lot easier. So I have a tool to change your behavior. I have one tool that will change your behavior without considering anything else. I want you, can you all stick your hands up for me? Everyone put your hands up. All right, awesome, high as I can go. Uh, awesome, great. Now I want you to raise it two inches higher. Fantastic, well done. Great job for whoever just stood up down the bottom there. Um, so that is accountability. Accountability is the tool that we have to change behavior just on the surface of it. There is always a gap. There is always a place where your self-discipline in achieving what you want to achieve fails. And it's always short of where your full potential lies. Anybody that's ever had a fitness instructor or anything like that knows the way that accountability works. You're doing push-ups. They're not teaching you how to do a better push-up. They're just sitting there going, okay, let's go for 10 push-ups. Six, seven, eight, 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 eight. It's like, come on, man, you can count. I know you can count. But they're getting extra out of you because they're holding you accountable. I want you to write down three things 
I want you to take a second and write down three things that you know you should be doing in your business right now, but are not. What are three things that you should be doing now? In fact, I'll expand it to personal as well. You should be exercising, doing something else. You know, the typical New Year's resolution. What are three things that you should be doing, but are not? Some of you got that done pretty quickly. <laughs> okay. So, Bill's going to hold you accountable to doing those three things. And there would be a punishment if you don't do it and a reward if you do. For example, Bill might say, okay, whoever does not get the first thing on their list done by the end of the year, donates a thousand bucks to the Bill Benevolent Fund. And Bill is gonna use that fund to pay anybody that did achieve those particular goals, a thousand dollar bonus. I think that would be a great way for it to work. Those underperformers can give a bonus to those that do perform. Now, how many, how many of you are shitting yourselves right now? No, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, okay, fantastic. That's accountability. I didn't need to teach you new skills. I don't need to adjust your beliefs, your values, and identity. I assume, or I'm hoping, that that will be enough to change behavior. Now, it's good, but it's short term. It's relatively short term. You're going to run out of a list of things to do pretty quickly. You're going to run out of the easy stuff. And then we're going to have to start working a little bit further down. So this brings us to skills. Now, I obviously have a tool to grow your skills, and that is called education. Teach you the how. Now, this is very important for your long-term development. You've heard of the old saying, give a man a fish versus teach a man to fish. As coaches, we actually do more than that. We teach a man to learn to fish. Because if I teach you to fish, I might teach you to fish with a line. I, as your teacher, might not believe in a net. But you're really good with nets. So sometimes you can be limited if I'm only teaching you what I already know instead of teaching you how to learn. So a coach would say, go out, find 10 different ways to fish, experiment with each of them, come back to me with your favorite. Now we might already know, we already know what is most practical and what's the best method for the conditions and that sort of stuff. But for ownership, it's good for you guys to understand that. So skills can be expanded by education. But here's what I find. You know you want to change your behavior. People learn what they need to learn. But guess what? They continue to avoid doing what they need to do. I'll tell you one thing over the last 25 years, um, you know, I've been blessed and lucky enough to go from what I would call a, a, a middle of the range, average sort of corporate consultant type guy, self-employed guy, um, to a very happily married with great kids, moldy, moldy millionaire with a supercar daily drive parked out the front. We are really, really lucky, but that has been a very difficult journey. It's been a really challenging journey down the bottom here. So this comes down to, I'm going to actually jump down and come down to your environment, and your identity, and we're going to work up because the pinch point for your development is actually here in the middle. So your environment, who grew up as children of successful wealthy entrepreneurs hands up 
All right. I don't have any hands up. Okay. So most of you guys, I'm guessing, would have been good at what you did. The old classic, eventually you decided you're working for an idiot and you do this better and that better and then decided to go work for a lunatic yourselves. And maybe the journey started there, self-employed. Maybe you had a management buyout of a business, but you, you didn't come from the entrepreneurial side of the, uh, of the spectrum. So who wants... Who wants a new car? Who wants a new, something nice like a new car when, when you get some sweet money? Right. Does anybody, okay, does anybody not want a new car? Hands up, as I can see. Okay, a few people don't want a new car. Okay. Um, Kenyatta, you don't want a new car? Why don't you want a new car? I mean, I really like my Camry. <laughs> Your Camry? Yeah, and, and I, you know, I just, I feel like, you know, a car depreciates with value. I would like to invest in a little bit, something different than a car. Okay, what do you want? Uh, I would probably get an investment property. Nice, okay. And a new car. Sure, after that, yes, definitely. After that, okay, good. I like your priorities. Who else didn't want a car? Okay, Crane, don't want a car? No, sir. I got one. <laughs> Just the one? Well, a couple, but only one that's new. Okay. Uh, what do you want? A uh, thousand acres of mountain land. Nice. Well, beautiful. And then you'll need a big monster truck or something with knobby wheels to, uh, to get around on that. I'm assuming. <laughs> Shall I be a car? Yeah, probably. Yep. No. Guys, my point is, and it's, it's funny, I, I've done, obviously, workshops all over the world, and I like to find where people start pushing back on wealth and on the nice things. And I'll say, okay, who, who wants a new car? Ah, oh, he, everyone wants a new car. Okay, who wants a, who wants a Bugatti? Oh, I don't know about it. A new car is okay. A Ferrari's fine. Lamborghinis, st people start to push back. Uh, an aeroplane, people start to push back on aeroplanes. Oh, why would I want an aeroplane? And what happens is that we come up with so many excuses as to why we wouldn't want that stuff. But I've got a perfectly good car. Oh, the aeroplane, you'd have to put a bunch of money into feeding it and getting it off the ground. We, we defend our position. We defend our lack of desire with all of the justifications as to why that's a dumb idea. Now that's understandable. This is very generational programming, the guys, okay? For, for you know, 15, uh, 1,500, 2,000 years, we've been programmed with this shit of lack. The church and the royalty, the church in particular says, you don't want that stuff. You, don't, that, that's, you want to be humble. You'll get yours in the afterlife. You, you, don't, you don't want all of the wealth and comfort and that sort of stuff, modesty, humility, hard work, that will get you into the afterlife, right? You don't want that sort of stuff. So put it in the collection basket as it goes around and, and we'll buy prime property and, and have all the beautiful stuff along the way. Not that I'm poo-pooing religion, people. That's, that's okay. It gives, us, it gives us something to believe in. And the royalty, they took it with money. So when the royalty takes something and then the, the, the church typically, historically tells us you don't want it anyway, we're, we're happy to do the work of the minions. So we're programmed with the sour grapes mentality. So when we grow up in that environment, when you're born, you're born into an environment and you create your identity. Your identity is hardwired in your brain by the time you grow kneecaps at three years old. Two to three years old, your identity is programmed. So what your identity is, is as an infant, you sit there, sucking your thumb, observing life. And in observing life, you suck it up and you, your synapses hardwire. You can't communicate what you think about what you're seeing. You, you accept it as absolute gospel and truth. You can't ask questions about it, and there's no explanations about it. Who ever explained to an infant why mummy and daddy are fighting over something? 
Not that they would understand anyway. The only thing you can express is to, is to cry about something. But that is the most important program. So by the time you've turned three, that's hardwired in your brain. It's called immature cognitive commitment. It's hardwired. Then what happens is at the age of three, three to about four or five, what do three-year-olds start doing? They start talking, and what's the first thing that comes out of their mouth? But why? But why? But why? Anyone who's got kids knows that. So then the people that programmed them with the identity justify that whole situation to their kids and define a lot of their values. And then a lot of the time we spend our entire lives trying to undo that initial programming and extend beyond the, the, the identity and the values and what our parents and what our society told us. And it is really difficult. So my question comes to this. What do you value? What do you value? I'm, I'm going to give you, I don't know, let's say a minute or two to have a think about what you value. I value, uh, and just write down some of the things that you value, the top things that you really value in your life. Okay, so who's got one? Who's got something that they really value? Uh, yep. Freedom of time. Freedom of time. So what does that get you? What do you, you, you value freedom? Freedom of time. So ex explain that, Lewis. I've got the ability to do what I want when I want, with who I want. Nice. Okay. Control. So you value control. You value being able to make a decision and have control over your actions and your situation. Would that, would that be right? Okay. Beautiful. You value control. Nice. Who's got another one? Uh, Craig had one. Craig. My wife. You value your wife. Excellent. Why? She's a good cook. <laughs> No, it, it'd take me all day to tell you. Okay, so you value you value companionship, love, connection. Yes, yes, all okay. those. All right, awesome, fantastic. Who's got another one? Uh, Catherine, okay. you're unmuted. I'm guessing education. Okay, you value intelligence, education. I don't know which way you want to say it. No, that's okay. All right. Um, why? That's a really hard question. See, to get to the values, you've got to be a three-year-old. But why? But why? But what does that give you? If you bring it back, it probably gives you control. Mm -hmm. Probably yes. Okay, so education brings you back to control. It's a good, so it's a question I learned early on. So what does that get you? So what does that give you? So what does that give you? That brings you down to the primal core values. Nice one, but but that's that's excellent. Um, uh, Chip, Chip had one, I think. I did, health. Health, beautiful. And again, if we dug down, it would potentially be because it gives you control. Okay, you are able to perform, you're able to do what you need to do because you have health. If you're unhealthy, you're not in control anymore. You, you become a victim, you become one of the weak animals on the prairie and you're gonna get eaten by something. Okay, uh, awesome. Uh, Tim, you had something, you're unmuted. Oh, um, beautiful places. 
like lake houses, beach houses. Okay, uh, value. So it might be experiences uh, in nature. <clears throat> okay. um, all right, good. Um, let's put peace. Maybe peace, serenity, that sort of thing. Nice places, good place to chill. Awesome. Um, all right, fantastic. So these are the these are our values. Now this is where the crunch comes. Another one that I'm going to add because I've done a lot of work digging down into this is respect. All right, a combination of control and respect is typically what we desire or value most. Every living animal desires above everything else, desires or values control. Control over the environment, control over their situation. They need to be in control as a living thing. Even plants need to be in control. They value control. Nobody values a lack of control. Even these people that are adrenaline druggies going, oh, I love being out of control. Really? Jump off a cliff then, see how you feel. They don't love being out of control. They love seeing how difficult the situation can be whilst still being in control. The other thing that we want is respect. Now, for men, typically, the priority is respect. For ladies, the priority is love. Now, I say that typically, and this is from a sociological perspective, um, the larger group, um, women can feel loved without necessarily being respected. Men typically find it impossible to be loved without being respected, if, if that makes sense. So, so it's a little bit different, a little bit, bit skewed uh, between there. But love and respect, we value most. So here's the crunch of it. Our environment and our upbringing and our identity defines or describes how our beliefs satisfy our values. How your beliefs satisfy your values. So, you want control. How do you believe you get control as a business owner? How do you believe you get control? Has anybody got an idea? Who, who'd like to give us an idea? What gives you control in your business? Anybody? Uh, Walter. Uh, you can control the strategy. You can control the direction. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, that's, that's what you can't control. Sure. So how do you, but how do you achieve that control? You value control. How do you believe, how do you achieve that control in your business? Money. People. No, so I, mean, money. I mean, I mean, if you don't have the money, then that buys you your freedom. It buys you control. It buys you peace. Okay. Yep. Good. But uh, th that is a thing. So how do you believe, what's the best way for you to get the money? Well, I have a quality product. Yep. Live on time, have okay. good margins, have good awesome. processes, have good pro protocols, good team, all that. Okay. Fantastic. How many hours a week do you work? Well, I mean, I'm, all, I'm, I'm thinking about it probably 120 hours a week. I'm always thinking about it, whether I'm actually doing it or not. So, I mean, I'm in the office 50. I'm thinking okay. about it all the time. If I'm not thinking about it, I'm, I'm listening to a podcast or something along those lines that, that kind of helps me refigure my mindset, right? Okay. So this is one of the challenges in business. We believe we get control typically by doing it ourselves. How will we, how, you think back to your programming as a child. You need, you need to work hard to make what sort of living? 
An honest living. You've got to work hard to make an honest living. That was the belief of the industrial age, inferring that if it's not hard, it's not honest. Mm -hmm. So we have this really hard work ethic because that satisfies <laughs> respect. I want you to think of yourself as a three-year-old and it's easy to do this vicariously when you have children. Who's, who's got kids? Hands up, who's got kids? Okay, fair few of you got kids, great. So if a three-year-old, if you come out with a plate of cookies, you're having a bit of a party or a gathering or a barbecue, you bring out a plate of a pile with little cookies and a little Billy standing there, the three, four-year-old kid, five-year-old kid, and you go and you offer him the plate of cookies. How many cookies does Billy take? <laughs> All of them, as many as his little fat fingers can handle. What is the reaction to that? <coughs> one, Billy, one. Don't be greedy. Don't be selfish. Share. Wait your turn. If there's something left over at the end, then you can have. But don't take more than your fair share. Okay, so Billy Hardwires this in his brain. If I take more than my allocated amount, I'm selfish, thoughtless, and greedy. If you come in and Billy's sitting on his bed staring into space, come on, Billy, let's go play ball. Let's go do something. Let's go do some activity. Oh, I just want to sit here. I don't want to play ball. I just want to chill out. Oh, you are so lazy. Come on, don't be lazy, don't be lazy, don't sit there, let's get out in the sunshine, let's do what I want to do, instead of what you want to do, by the way. Let's, let's, let's get out in the sunshine and do something, you wouldn't want to be lazy. So we're programmed, we don't want to be respected. Respect does not mean that we're lazy, selfish, thoughtless or greedy. So we, 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 we don't take advantage of the opportunities that we have. Most people are stuck in this, in, this, in this cycle. They believe they get control through doing it themselves. As business owners, I did. I'm in control because I do it myself, because that's how you brought up. You, you were an employee, you were in control, you did your job. People appreciated you for that. You were working hard to make an honest living and somebody's laughing in the background, paying you a little bit of a salary going, <laughs> nice. So you, you were reinforced in your belief that working hard to make an honest living and do a really good job, you get to keep your job. Now, we believe we do it ourselves. So when we bring on people, we, we didn't give up that belief. And we micromanage. And micromanaging people is the best way to get people to quit. You want somebody to quit? Just micromanage them. They'll be gone in a week. But we think in order to have control, we need to micromanage people. Do you think Richard Branson believes he gets control by doing it himself? No, how does he believe he achieves his value of control? By empowering and enabling other people. Henry Ford didn't believe he got control through building motor cars himself. He believed he got control through employing people that were way better at anything, everything than he was. So then we've got respect. How do you believe you get respect? Oh, I get respect for my hard work ethic. I'm respected by my staff because I turn up first to work and I leave last. Well, I can tell you that's not a lot of fun. It is, but it's, it's a, it's a self-defeating uh, thing. Everybody goes on about it, it. Everybody, see, people reinforce what they believe. 
Who believes you should lead from the front? Hands up. Excellent. Yeah, that's bullshit. Leading from the front went out in the Middle Ages. Why? Because the king that led the army into battle was the first one to get their head chopped off. And then the rest of the army ran away. So leading from the front doesn't happen. Do your leaders lead from the front? No, your leaders and my leaders, I'm ex-military, our leaders lead from a bunker that's nice and safe. They get a good night's sleep. They get fed. Now, being military and, and, and an ordinary rank, like, like starting at a private and, and working up, we always thumbed our noses at the officers because they, they weren't real men. They didn't have calluses on their hands. They couldn't shoot straight. Half of them didn't know which end to shoot from. Okay. They, didn't, they weren't real soldiers. So we were quite disparaging about them, which is all good and well until we get onto the battlefield and don't have any food or ammunition. And we, we want the officers to have one hour or two hours sleep a night like we do. Well, then they make dumb decisions because they're exhausted. So that's not the way it works. And for you guys as business owners, you're wanting to be an officer and run an army, but you're still stuck in the ordinary ranks thinking that you need to be there with, be one of the boys. You don't need to set an example other than setting an example of leadership and empowerment. Right? If Brad was as hardworking as Bill and I, we wouldn't have 1,300 officers around the world. We'd still just have one. Brad's great strength is he's really, really lazy, <laughs> which is awesome. I don't know about you guys, and, and we love him for it because he lets us get, he doesn't step on our toes. He doesn't micromanage us. He doesn't go, oh, do it this way, do it, do it that way. He has people define that and that the organization grows. But you think of your schooling. I reckon there's three groups of kids at school. One, the super, super smart kids. Maths, chemistry, physics, all that sort of stuff. That was not me. Definitely not me. Then at the other end of the spectrum, you had the really, really dumb, lazy kids. Didn't do anything, played hooky, were, were always getting caned and in detention, that sort of stuff. They were just bottom end. And then you had the middle kids. After school finishes, all the really, really smart kids went and got jobs working for all the really, really lazy kids who built huge business empires but knew that getting the smart kids to do it was a good idea because they didn't want to do it or couldn't do it or didn't have the brains to do it. And they weren't risk averse. And the middle kids, like me, sort of struggling to keep up and, and, and do well, we just get good government and corporate jobs and nice, stable jobs for life sort of thing if, if you can. So control and respect are the big things you value. How are you getting those sort of things? Richard Branson, again, he believes he achieves respect through building a huge empire that can contribute to an entire community. So my point is here, my suggestion is that if you're going to become ultimately successful, and that is to set an example to your kids, that is to, to bring them up in the way that you would like them to grow. That is to build a secure, happy financial empire for generations to come. Maybe that's on your list, maybe it's not. Hopefully it is. To set an example for future generations so that they don't have to worry because I'm guessing in your, in your heads, you would love to be able to give your kids things that you never had. But if you have a, a sour grapes mentality, oh, you wouldn't, why would you want a why would you want a nice car? Why would you want a Ferrari? Why would you want more than one car? Why would you want a beautiful home? Then um, you know that, that's part of this identity, identity programming sort of stuff. 
So as you're doing your planning, you know, I think it would be a good idea to think about how one is, is your values, what do you value? But two, very importantly, where you were taught those particular values. My dad was a teacher and I'm assuming it was him. I think it was him. I had a mantra. I still remember the, the, the day and the place that I was standing in my old home, not that old, a, a decade ago. And the, the, but the mantra was do the best you can do every day and one day someone will see you. Do the best you can do every day, one day someone will see you. Now that's fantastic for an employee. That's a great mantra for somebody that's going to have a great job and it had served me well. I'd been headhunted and headhunted. I got out of the army and I started as a photojournalist and then somebody approached me to work for them, which I did. And then somebody else approached me to take over a company. And then the government approached me to be uh, a senior government advisor. I just headhunted. So that mantra served me really, really well. But then I had that revelation and I changed my mantra. I changed my mantra that says only ever take advice and criticism from people you aspire to be like. And that has served me far better. But it would be interesting for you to work out where you start to push back on, on wealth. I said, I'll show people a new car. Yeah, that's good. A Ferrari, yeah, that's okay. A mansion, well, that's fine. A helicopter, oh, I don't know about that. A Ferrari in a helicopter, oh, no, that would be a bit tacky. All the way to the ultimate one that's this Chinese guy sitting in his solid gold bathroom. The entire bathroom is gold, not just his toilet seat, the whole bathroom. And even I go, ooh, at what point do you start pushing back and, and going, oh, that's too expensive? I still have challenge paying for airfares, business class, first class airfares. I still find that, oh, maybe I should just go squirrel class and, and be a pretzel when I get somewhere. Because of course for us, you know, me getting from here in Brisbane to you guys in, in Virginia and that side of the country, I'm looking at easy 18,000 bucks. 12 to 18,000 bucks business class will get me a return trip to your side of the world and back. 2010, I took the family to Italy and I said, look, we'll go last row of business. The kids go first row of economy. It'll all be good. My wife didn't like that idea because it's like, what if something happens to them? <laughs> like what? They're on a plane. Well, I'm going to get kidnapped while they're on the plane. She didn't like that idea. It cost us uh, $39,000 in airfares just to get from Brisbane to London and back. And everybody had to go up the front. Now, I'd find it really hard to turn right and go down the back. But part of me, this, this identity part, still finds the idea of that much money obscene. I was in Mayfair last year after I was in, in Scotland. Beautiful shotguns in Mayfair, 340 grand. Now, that's pounds. Well, no, I think I convert that to dollars. No, I think that was 300 pounds. 300,000 pounds for a shotgun, and they only come in pairs. The one and a half million US for two shotguns. They're very, very nice shotguns. But it's like, are you kidding me? You know, and that's next to the Bugatti store that's next to... This is, this is mind boggling stuff. But if you start hanging out with people in that area and go, yes, I would like a car. I would like a couple of cars. I'd like to buy my wife a really nice car. I'd like to fly a business class. I'm sort of retired, but I'll fully retire in about five years and I've got a retirement budget. Who's got a retirement budget? What, what's your annual retirement, uh, your annual cost of living when you guys retire. Who, who's got that number in, in your heads? Walter, great. What, what's your number, Walter? A mil. A million? Okay, so a million five, a year back. Five, five, five million. Is, is that passive income or assets? That's assets. 
That's yeah. assets. Okay, so five or five hundred. That's about two hundred. Assets should provide two fifty to three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars yeah. on an annual basis, right? Two fifty a year. Nice, great, good that you've got that number. Who else has got that number? Oh, All right. Tim has. Tim has. You're nodding. Great. What's the number, Tim? Do you want to share it? Mine's uh, less seventy thousand. Seventy thousand a year. Okay, that's good. I'm, I was thinking modest, but good. It's a good start. You're still young. Awesome. Yeah. Did you? Did you? Have you did you have a number? No. Who? Who else has got a number? We want to know what Bill's. We want to know what Bill's number is. <laughs> My number? Yeah, it's it's it's. I'm happy to share. It's it's four million. In assets? Yeah. Okay, so so a couple of hundred, couple of hundred grand a year. Yeah. All right. As far as passive income, as far as actual cash coming in, our number's a hundred grand a year for airfares. That's allocated just airfares. All right, so, so getting, uh, obviously there are other numbers that you want. You know, you want to have fun with your kids. You want to travel with your kids. You want to go on, on nice trips to nice places. For my 60th birthday, we want to go and, and have six nights on the Orient Express. All right, six nights on the Orient Express from Istanbul to Venice. Right, is $65,000 per person. That's $10,000 per night per person for six nights. Now that, that gets my interior a little bit freaked out because <laughs> it's not that far off. It's only 70 years off, but it's like crap. So I would just suggest that because this will hold you back if you don't want more than your fair share because of this programming and you can't reconcile that and go that no longer applies, then you're gonna have a challenge. Well, it's, it's, you're not going to have a challenge. You're going to do okay. You're going to be mediocre. But I don't want you to get to the point where your business satisfied your values because it was a make-work project until you realized that you were too old to work and then you had an auction and a fire sale and, and you got a bit of money for it and then you went on a, a pension or you had a bit of money in a 401k that allowed you to go camping each year. So please get a really clear vision and you're going through this in your plan, a clear vision. What is a day in the life of the retired you going to look like? What is a month in the life? What is a year in the life going to be? And what sort of budget do you need for that? A combination of passive, active and entrepreneurial income and work towards that methodically. Because you want to bring your kids up believing that they can have whatever they want in life. I'm assuming we were we were sort of told that, but we the people didn't explain how. We we love at the moment that our kids, I mean my daughter's 23, my son's 22, and my other son's 19. But we love that when the you know the world went to crap and we started, you know, investing in shares that the kids wanted to invest in shares too. And they learned about it and they had their bits of money and they wanted to in invest and exploit the opportunity as, as well. I think all of us as parents want that for our kids to grow up happy, healthy, wealthy. And having a Ferrari doesn't mean that you're an asshole. <laughs> you can be comfortable, you can be happy, you can be charitable. It's easier to be charitable when you've got some money to spare. But number one rule, the wisdom of the flight attendants, fit your own oxygen mask before assisting others financially. We're so busy trying to save the world whilst not enjoying life and setting them an example, I think sometimes, a little too much. So this is the crunch, the beliefs, how, do they, how are your values satisfied by your beliefs and maybe you need to change beliefs. And then Bill can help you with the education and the skills 
and the understanding to change those beliefs. And the behavior will change as a symptom. So let's open up for some, uh, some questions. Any questions I would imagine that you would like to ask beyond um, whether it be within this or beyond it. Yep, he's here. You got a question for Steve? About anything. We got him here. You got a question about your business you don't have answered? Um, excuse me, I have a quick question. Sure. I know you focused on your b beliefs, the belief system. Can you just kind of go over that again? I think that's where, I think I have some limiting belief systems. <laughs> and I think that's no, a hinder. We, we all do. We all do. Yeah. But your beliefs, people tell you what your beliefs are. Right. You, you, and, and this comes back to fear. Fear is a false expectation appearing real. Most of your beliefs are based around fear. Whether you, whether you, what you, you fear you won't go to heaven. You fear you lose something. You fear. So a false expectation appearing real. But what is? You are born with one fear when you are. When you're born, you only have one fear. What is that fear? Does anyone know the one fear that you're actually born with that's hardwired? Public speaking. <laughs> good, good answer, no. Fire. Sorry? Fire. Uh, no, I don't think so. You're Fair. born with the you're form with, born with the fear of death. Yeah. No, if somebody comes and threatens you with a gun. You don't even know what death is. Falling. The only fear that you're actually born uh, with is falling. So when a baby comes out, the doctor typically drops its, its hand under the, the from the back of the baby's head. And if the baby starts, great, its brain's connected. That's the only way you can tell. So the only fear that you're actually born with is falling. A baby, an infant, when they get to crawl, crawls, they don't fall downstairs. Much as we put up barricades and everything normally, typically they will stop out of stair because they fear falling but everything else is programmed you know I, a program and they're typically programmed by our parents and society right right i also think i also think that based upon where you know the stratification that you are in your society for example this is used just straight through the three straight three lower class middle class and upper class and so far as the expectations of money, right? <clears throat> is that if you're born with a lot of money, then you expect to have money, right? If you're, if, and so you view money differently. And, and just like it, as they view, they have this thing called uh, stratification of, of education that the lower class looked at, looked at as, as a way out. Um, uh, middle class looked at it as a way to stay and upper class looked at it as a way to network, right? They used it to network to make more money. And so I think that that's kind of also, some people feel, um, you know, there's an old saying, I don't know if you guys heard it you know, in South, he's rising above his raising, right? You know, he's trying to get too big for his own britches, right? And, you know, we've got to hold him back. This guy's trying to be too good, right? And I think some of those things can be self-limiting to people. And Absolutely. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. You, you, or I would say you rise to your level of acceptance. You've right. all got exactly what you've decided to have in life. Yep. All right. Beyond that, we, we have the little evil saboteur. I call mine stupid Steve. I'm smart Steve. He's my invisible friend, stupid Steve, that has those limiting beliefs. You are not worthy of that thing. You are not smart enough. You're not educated enough. You are not. And these are just excuses to satisfy the, the, the values, but absolutely, um, you know, rising beyond your level of acceptance. And that comes through the environment. As you said, growing up in the lower classes, middle classes, upper classes, yeah, there's, there's the assumption. Now, what's interesting is the three generation rule, make it, manage it, lose it. Right, oh yeah. So the first generation makes the wealth because they appreciate the hard work. Second generation manages it because they were close enough to appreciate it. 
third generation just squanders it because they don't understand the mechanics of, of making it and managing it. They, they're just entitled people, for sure. So yeah, really good point. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Good point. Questions? No, it's been a long day, but I know some of y'all got some. I have another question. Yep. So back to your chart, you have the tool of accountability to change behavior. You have the tool of education to yeah. change the skill. How do you go about with changing the beliefs and the values or um, what tools do you have to help others change? Good one, good one, thank you. So the tool to change your beliefs is reflection. Reflection, how, who programmed me with this belief? When I had my son, Mitch, I think he was maybe a, a few months old, I'm giving him a bath and, uh, and he splashed around in a couple of inches of water in the bath and I'm like, oh, cut it out, let's just get washed, get out. And I thought intellectually, that's unreasonable. Well, why wouldn't I let him? I, I got nowhere to go. I got nowhere to be. So I went and rang my dad. And I said, Dad, why wouldn't you let me muck around in the bath when I'm like three months old? <laughs> Dad's like, oh, shit. Do you remember that now? Uh, because I did that. It's an unconscious apprenticeship that we did. Life is a mirror. What we do is a mirror of, of our programming. So where did I learn that? And he said, well, we were on a fairly rural property. It was drought. We're always in drought. We're on tank water. We couldn't get any water. So basically two inch baths were what the entire family had. And it started with, you know, your, your brother, then you, then your sister, then your mother, then me, all using the same two inches of water. So it was a very focused. So he said, by the time it got to me, it's like A, filthy and B, stone cold and C, normally is scraping on the side of the bar. But because of that reflection, I can go great and I can strike that off as an unconscious stimulus response mechanism and go, that doesn't apply anymore. Huh, okay, great. So reflection is how to change your beliefs. To change your values, that gets more difficult, but not more difficult. But perspective is needed, a change in perspective is needed to change your values. Right? If you've got a, let's say kids that are really super entitled and they, you know, they value all of this sort of stuff, great, send them off to a, a, do some missionary work in, you know, Pakistan or India or, or, or somewhere like that. Yep. Kick them out of the house with a couple of bucks, no credit card or a phone and see how they fare. You know, that will change their perspective. My daughter, bless her, and this is, it's hard, but it is, it is challenging, the cha the most, one of the most challenging things about becoming wealthy is what do you teach your kids? How do you teach your kids about money? We, you know, we knew how hard it was, but they didn't see that. So uh, a couple of years back, my daughter's hanging out the washing and um, on the line, and she was, she was asking, she was complaining that she couldn't reset the tire pressure sensor in her Mercedes. Now, it's not a new Mercedes. It was a B-class that we sort of handed down to her and we did make her buy it. But the fact is, she's still 19, has a, has a Benz. And I was saying, look, I don't know, <laughs> Google it or something. But my wife was having a laugh and Laura looked up from the line and goes, well, what is it? And my wife said, it's just so funny. It's such a first world problem, darling. And Lauren said, but that's where I live. It was like, oh, good, touche. Good point. How, how are we supposed to blame these kids for their entire sense of entitlement when that's what we, that's the environment that we brought them up in? Right. So perspective is difficult. Down here is psychiatry and drugs, probably to change your identity. That's that's all that's all messed up. I, I don't know about that stuff. That's that's why the iceberg is so big. It's difficult to chip away through that. This this is easy stuff. But reflection. Think about what you were taught by your parents and your upbringing about money. Were, 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 did your you know if if you had less than what you would have liked. 
How did your parents justify it? What were the excuses that you got from your parents? Hey, why don't we go skiing up in Banff with the rest of the kids? Oh, well, that would be a waste of... Well, isn't it more important to have family and, and stay at home and, and do things around here? Hey, why can't we get a Ferrari? Oh, well, those people are assholes. They don't, they don't appreciate people. They don't do whatever. They don't, they're not nice people. If they, they're wasteful, they're selfish, they're thoughtless. Right? So think back if you can, as far back as you can to your programming and, and the lies that you were potentially programmed with. And it's not that they're lies, it's that they're perspective of your parents because that's what they were taught by their parents. You know, the, the, the GI parents. Right. Cool. Embrace, embrace, having, embrace having fun. And, and I enjoy thinking, God, what, am I, what are the mates of my kids think of us? We don't seem to work particularly hard. We obviously enjoy what we're doing. We hope that we set them an example. And we don't do it to set them an example. We just do it because that's what we like doing well, that was a great question good thank you for reminding me about those last couple okay any other any other questions what's the next one hey steve uh do you do you see do you guys see people that are in poverty kind of get this stuff uh you know what i mean like the people that are really poor do you see much change in those type of situations it certainly can be certainly can be but the reasons can be different i mean you can have people impoverished people that become you know incredible leaders thought leaders and activity leaders and charitable leaders because they believe in that their value of respect they believe they get respected through um redeeming others um, so again, this is, this, there can certainly be a shift in the, in the, in the beliefs and values, but most people are never, most people don't have access to this education in, in mindset and self-awareness and, and that sort of thing, Tim. So if you, if you've got that opportunity there, you know, that's to, to teach you to help them. That's, that's fantastic. That's all we want to do. Right, another question. Now, okay, let me just throw in something else here. For those of you that have got kids and sort of youngish kids, the situation, my daughter, trouble with having aware kids. Um, remember when my daughter was small, maybe five or six, she was playing out the front doing some beading, making beads in the, in the sand pit. And um, my wife was... Uh, looking out the kitchen window at her and Lauren had complained that Melissa didn't spend, my wife didn't spend um, enough time with her. Oh, we never get to, you know, play and do stuff together. So Melissa saw her beating and so she went, fine. So she went out and said, hey darling, what you doing beating? And hey, let's do some beating together. So they did beating for about an hour. And then Melissa came back inside. Lauren eventually came in and said, oh, Mum, we never get to spend time doing stuff that, you know, I want to do together. And Melissa, my wife, said, but we just spend an hour out front beating together. And again, Lauren said, but I was beating because you weren't there. It's like, damn it, bloody, bloody self-aware kids. But that made me realise how often, you know, as dads, hey, Mitch, come on, let's go throw the ball. Well, he might not want to throw the ball. So I learned to say, hey, Mitch, I'm here. Let's spend a couple of hours. What do you want to do? He might want to go and stare at worms in the backyard or chase chickens around the yard. But instead of just, just to help some of you with, with kids and uh, look, even if they're old kids. You know, hey, kids, let's go out to dinner somewhere. You know, bring your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Hey, look, why don't we spend Thursday together? What would you like to do? Oh, we'd like to sit on the couch with you and watch a movie. 
So again, that allows them to develop more of their own stuff instead of assuming that they want to do what you want them to do, just as a, as a bonus thought. Steve, I have another question while we're talking about kids. What's a, if you've achieved a certain level of success, how can you raise your kids without a ment an entitlement mentality, uh, without them being spoiled brats and not realizing how hard it is to come by? Good question, Craig. I'm hoping we got it right. Look, at the end of the day, um, so I, I, when I, just, just piece by piece, don't just explain what you're doing. Explain what you think to them instead of, particularly if they're showing interest. Don't force it on them. Don't force them to learn that sort of stuff. Do what you're doing, be happy, be authentic, be sincere in, in your life, and they will, they will appreciate it. So, for example, but, but I will give you some examples. So, Lauren, we were teaching the kids about passive income. And I explained to Lauren, I said, okay, well, passive income, is, it's, it's little bit by little bit. And I said, okay, you have a little bit of money in your bank account. It makes a, a, a couple of bucks a month passive income because interest is, is passive income. So your passive income pays for the family's toothpaste bill. So if you put a couple of hundred bucks in the account, the interest pays for our toothpaste forever. We'll always have bright, shiny teeth as long as you don't take that couple of hundred bucks out of the bank account. So little bit by little bit, we, we try to teach them the idea of that. Um, I had things like, so, so they had a list of things they could do for extra pocket money. Um, and one of them was wash the car. You know, they never did that particularly well, but give it a go. And so uh, Lauren went and washed the car with the, with the boys and came back and said, oh, can I have my money now? And I said, as soon as you give me an invoice, I'll pay you. And it was like, what's an invoice? It was like, okay, well, you do a piece of paper saying, here's the job that I did and here's the money that I owe. You give that to me so I know that it's done and then I pay you based on that. And that, that's huge because what happened when we were kids? We did a job and we expected our parents just to do the right thing and give us money. Anybody got outstanding debts in your business because you haven't sent invoices and chased them up? It's interesting because this comes down to this belief and value thing. We hate asking for the money. We, ju we just think because, you know, that's pushy. We just think that it will happen. So not only teaching them the belief and the value stuff, but also the mechanics of how money flows, how to measure it, and, and that sort of stuff, Craig. Um, but yeah, that, that's, it's tricky. It, it is tricky, that's for sure. Because uh, what if yeah, my son, a couple of months back, he came out, Melissa made some sort of comment, and my son said, oh, well, that's all right. That's because you're filthy rich. And my wife turned around and said, we are not filthy. <laughs> I went, oh, that's awesome. yeah, good, quick, quick, quick thinking. Um, but it still gives me, it still freaks me out a, a, a little bit. We're spending, you know, we're, we're building our dream home. We've never built a dream home before. We work hard. We've invested in property and that sort of stuff. Yeah, and, and what we pay freaks me out. You know, we're spending 22,000, uh, yeah, 22,000 on forces. It's like, what the hell? What are they bloody made out of? You know, it's, it's, it's weird, but... we. The other thing that is good for you is what other, is to believe what other people think of you is none of your business, right? Don't get sucked back down into the, don't allow yourself to be judged by the tribe that you have left, okay? Try and separate yourself from the good opinion of other people that judge you because you are starting to elevate yourself wealth-wise or because you can... Uh, start some enjoyment. That is that is, is is a big factor as well. Cool. Got time maybe for one more, Bill? One more. Just one more. Go on one. So Go um, when you were talking about beliefs and fears, you had like an acronym for fears or fears was an acronym for something. What were you saying that was? False expectations appearing real. Yes. 
easy one because it's all programmed. We, you know, our neighbors behind, their, their, their kids are scared of dogs. They haven't even been bitten by a dog, but if their mother got bitten by a dog, so their mother's obviously programmed them. The all dogs are vicious, will bite them, and they don't know why they fear dogs, but they don't. I got one more question. All right, Tim. So, Jared, if you, quick. if you, I'm, I'm about 32. If you went back to being around 30, what would you try to tell yourself to do differently? Yeah, it was a few weeks ago now, Tim. Um, <laughs> what would I tell myself? 30. Man, what are they doing? Oh, shit. <laughs> Um, probably to, 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 do, to work your strengths, not your weaknesses. I think in my 30s, I was trying to um, fill the gap of what I wasn't good at instead of accentuating my strengths. So if you're not good at Numeral, new, uh, financial literacy, for example, and you can tell you're not good at because you don't do it. It's what you pro probably procrastinate at. So if you're not good at financial, it, don't go and do mild courses and try and you know do a, do accounting and all that sort of stuff. Find a better accountant, so you don't have to work your weaknesses. Spend time focusing on your strengths. That's what we we try to get you to do as coaches: work your strengths, not work your weaknesses mitigate the threats that you're vulnerable to because of your weaknesses but focus on what you on your what your strengths because then that's what you you love i i wasted a bit of time in my 30s trying to do what other people thought i should do even though it wasn't my strength good question great question thank, you. thank you steve really appreciate you doing this um and uh, yeah, we'll catch up after Christmas, I guess. So, well, you mate, guys, have a, uh, have a fantastic Christmas. Stay warm. It was like uh, last week, week before last, it was uh, 112 here. So, but then uh, over the weekend, we had 10 inches of rain. So, we're still trying to work out what the hell is going on here. So, um, what happens when you live in mostly the tropics? <laughs> Almost tropics. Almost. Oh, tropics. Have a great so festive season with your family. We'll uh, we'll catch you soon. Thank you, Bye, Steve. Good luck. Thanks, Steve. Yeah.